here are our questions. So here's the top 11 that I got from what you, so those who posted, thank you so much. I have mostly got all your questions. Mm -hmm. There's only one or two that I didn't answer. And it's really only where they are really going to get answered next week or the next two weeks, because um, I obviously know what's coming. So anyway, I'm just going to just bash into these. It's the best way of doing it. But and the, as I say, the approach I'm taking here is not the rapid fire approach that we've been taking with Jared in the last few weeks. I'm really trying because these questions have bubbled up more than once in many cases, particularly the first few, I've decided to try and give you a more considered answer. Well, you can judge for yourself whether it's uh, it's adequate to the purpose. Here we go. What's the first? So the first question, what's the best English translation? Now, in each case, I'm, I'm going to say one thing here. Do down when you get this, um, the presentation, I will send it tomorrow. When you do get it, do download it and have a look. I'm not going to read the questions in detail. I'm just going to give you the essence of them. But for the purpose, for the purpose of the people who asked the questions, I wanted them to know that I had read them properly and tried to take them on board. And so if you're the questioner in each case, you'll know who you are. The rest of you don't worry about reading all the detail. The essence of this question is I've been using various translations and none of them seem to be perfect what's the best one? And so that's that's the way I'm going to answer the question. And so the answer to that is really, it's horses for courses. Um, there are different ways of using the scriptures. One is to study it. Another is to use it in your prayer. And another thing is to use it in a group, um, you, know, you know, in the way that we're doing now, for example. Yet another way is in the public liturgy. And of course, you know, if you read the tablets, um, you'll be familiar with the fact that they're in, the bishops of England Wales have been having a bit of a debate over which English translation they should use in the liturgy to replace the one that we're using at the moment. So there's a picture of the lectionary there just to remind you about that. With every translation, I'd suggest there are two real key challenges. One is trying to be accurate to the original language, but on the other hand, also trying to be readable and understandable and those different aims are not mutually exclusive, but they there is a tension between them, I'd say. And so, broadly speaking, and this is a really massive oversimplification, we've got, if you like, broadly two types of translation philosophy. We've got translations that try to mostly go word for word and, if you like, focus more on the accuracy side. And then there are those that try to kind of go more on the readability and comprehension using a technique that's often referred to as dynamic equivalence, uh, but it's a kind of thought for thought. And I'm just going to take those and show you, this is not my picture. I, I found this um, and it is produced by a publisher of Bible translations. So you know, um, beware your sources, as it were. I just wanted to point out, it's broadly right that, you know, some translations are at the word for word end. And so the ESV, which you might have heard of, which is the translation that we're going to get um, in England and Wales soon. I don't know exactly when. Um, that's more towards the literal um, word for word end of the scale. Whereas to take an example down here, here's the Good News Bible. And that's really so, you know, so far on the thought for thought element that it's really sort of paraphrasing in a lot of ways because it, it sets high, um, uh, high emphasis on comprehension. And then there's various translations like the NRSV, which I tend to use most. And I'll tell you why in a second, kind of in the middle. Some of you may be familiar with the NIV. And there's the King James, for example, which is more towards the literal end of the fail. Anyway, find your favorite translation there. It doesn't show them all because this um, publisher is a publisher of evangelical translations. Um, so it doesn't have much time for Catholic ones. But anyway, that's a diff that's another matter. Um, you, can, you can probably locate your own favorite translation on that scale. The point is they're different. Here's a small example of why translation is difficult. And this was an example quoted by the questioner. I think it's a really good one to use. So you'll remember the story of um, you know, Jesus um, basically walking on the water and saying, it is I, do not be afraid. And that's what most English translations say. I'm not expecting you to read the Greek here. I'm just putting it here for reference for some of the things I'm going to say. The point here is that the phrase it is I in Greek is ego eimi, which is literally I am. It is 
when you conjugate your verb to be, as every good language student does in whatever language they're learning, then ego e mi is how you start the verb to be. That's present tense of the verb to be, I am. Now, most mainstream translations use literally, it is I. The sole exception that I could find in the ones that I have access to um, is the New Jerusalem Bible, which says it's me. Um, I would suggest that that means that the New Jerusalem Bible has moved more towards the, if you like, um, the dynamic equivalence element of the scale than it has towards the literal. But you see, none of them are literal because that's I am. It's not it is I. Um, now, there's another factor here, though, and this is the really important factor because translation is only one part of the puzzle. You see, ego in this sentence, you don't normally need to put a pronoun with a Greek verb. So ego here in that place in the sentence, that's kind of take courage. I am, do not fear, not fear exactly. So ego is in an emphatic place. So the I element of it is strong. And in fact, this phrase, as I was pointing out a week, week, week or two ago, in the Septuagint, ego e mi is a statement of the divine presence. And if you want to see more about that, another shameless advert to my Bible word series. Um, I've got one on ego, um, which you can either have as a podcast or you can read the read the blog itself. But it's, it's worth having a look at, I, I would say, if you want to know more about this particular issue. Father Nick King does a wonderful and interesting thing. Courage, it is I in capitals very creative way of trying to suggest that there's something going on there. Now, you still need the exegesis to know what's going on, but it's a nice bit of hinting. But I did say that actually literal. this shows that literal translations, if you, if you have people who kind of say, oh, well, yes, I use this translation because it's, of course, you know, very literal and faithful to the Greek. Well, yeah, you know, pretty much all translations are non-literal. Let me give you a couple of examples. So aside from ego me, Hear these little words, ga and de. Um, uh, so ga means for and de means and or but. They never, in English, they're always the first word in the sentence, for and but. In Greek, they are never the first word in the sentence or pretty much never. Um, and so, again, if we were translating literally, we'd say they for all saw him, which would make pretty much no sense in English. So, you know, you can't go entirely literal. Um, Legei here, by the way, is not uh, past, it's present tense. It's an example of Mark's many uses of the historic present. Nick King uses a lot of those, but even he doesn't render every single example because it would drive you nuts to read. Um, so um, the key point here is that, you know, you can't be the Greek. The Greek is the Greek. This is English. Trans and the other thing is the translation is one thing and exegesis, in other words, rendering the real meaning is another thing altogether. You need both to get the full meaning. So it's not just about translation. You might be wondering, OK, well, what, what does Deacon Martin use? Well, I will tell you, it's not I don't think I'm a model for imitation, by the way. Um, I happen to use the NRSV Catholic edition. And the main reason I use that is because I think more people have it. Um, so that's what I'm using here. It's not necessarily my personal preference. I don't really have one. Um, I use the ESV because I understand that it's becoming increasingly important. So they're the two I tend to use just on a... Um, a boat. But I actually, using this wonderful software that I highlighted to you the other day, um, this Verbum software, I can get access to another 11 at least translations and quickly see in this little panel, compare how an individual verse is translated so that I... And, and, you know, the brilliant thing about software is you can do that so much quicker than going trying to get your way through a kind of 11 Bibles, basically. So that's and obviously I use the Greek. Here it is. And there are two main editions of the Greek, but I'm not going to bore you with that. I do use Father Nick's translation because I think it's really good. I think it always gives you an interesting insight that's worth having to think about. But that's what I use for study. For a prayer and reflection. I use entirely different Bibles and I use, as it happens personally, I use the Jerusalem Bible for most of my um, prayer oriented reflection on scripture. And I use the Grail Psalms when I'm reflecting on the Psalms. Now, there's two reasons for that. One is that it's liturgically um, driven, that these are the things that occur at mass. And so sometimes I'm preparing prayerfully 
for example, to preach as I am tomorrow and on Sunday. Um, and on other times I am just reflecting myself. And obviously the Grail Psalms are what come up in the prayer of the church, which I am obliged by my ordination to, um, to, 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 to say every day. So, but actually I also use them because I love them. They have been my Bible since I was old enough to commit to reading scripture, which was from the age of about 15 or 16. So they represent 40 years of love for me for those particular translations. I know their limitations. I'm lucky that I have, at least particularly for the Greek, have access to the original text. They still have a beauty and a value for me. So that's just, I thought it would be worth sharing that story just so you see the different uh, criteria apply in different ways. So some advice, if you want some, use more than one translation, particularly for the different uses, definitely use different translations because they each have their strength, but in study, use more than one. It's safer. You won't get bound up in one particular translation. And because it's richer, as we found ourselves in the groups, my real parting word to you is don't get carried away with interpretation based on individual words. Just be careful. Always ask yourself, is there somebody who can tell me what the Greek says? Because it may not reflect the Greek underneath, or at least the emphasis that you're putting on it may not reflect the Greek underneath. Because no English translation reflects all the subtleties of the Greek. And you've probably heard me say, oh, well, it's a pity that they didn't do this. But then, you know, they had other things to think of as well. Nick King says the wonderful um, Italian proverb, traditore, traduttore, which means basically to translate is to betray. So um, the translation inevitably betrays the original text. So how to get around this? Learn Greek. No, it, I, I'm not really suggesting you do that, though. Obviously, if you want to, I would heartily recommend it. I've uh, really enjoyed doing it myself. Um, but do in, in whatever ways you can. And I know it's not always possible. Become aware as possible of the Greek. And if you have friends, uh, friendly pastors, deacons or, or other scholars who um, who have the Greek, then, you know, bother them and ask them. Um, a reassurance for you all, though, most mainstream English translations are suitable for private study. They have their strengths and their weaknesses. As long as you're aware of that, you're fine. OK, let's talk about another topic, unclean spirits, because this came up a lot and has come up a lot in, in over the weeks. I know two key questions, really. Do they operate by God's permission? Otherwise, does God allow these spirits to operate? And the other one, which I think came up quite a few times, and I'll just bring up. The, the questions here you can see, hopefully recognize your own in here. Really, aren't these just what we'd say would be one form or another of mental illness? So let's take that. Let's take that question on. So certainly some of the symptoms that we see in the gospel could be recognized today by medical practitioners. And indeed, epilepsy, for example, which I know is not a mental a mental health uh, uh, issue, but, it, you know, is a condition. Epileptics were identified as such by Matthew, interestingly, in his gospel. There's two references there which you can look up for yourself if you want to see. None of this, though, eliminates the fact that there's also a spiritual dimension, even to physical healing, let alone uh, mental ones. And in Mark particularly, he wants to portray all of Jesus's healing as an inbreaking of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is coming through and that's what's being seen in the miracles. So the miracles are important and Jesus wants you to see them as a sign of the kingdom. He doesn't want you to see, oh, aren't you clever and kind of clapping. Because the kingdom of God is a clash against the kingdom of Satan. And Jesus is about to come into the strong man's house tie him up and take all his stuff which means win people back from satan and that's really what it's about and so every time there is these issues that's the dimension that mark wants to see and faith is a key factor in both the phys physical healing and the if you like psychological elements of the healing and even today and i'm clearly i'm not a medical professional nor even a healing professional but many practitioners recognize that there is a holistic dimension to healing and uh, uh, we've obviously had um, the development of a wonderful um, area of practice with Christian healing as well for example so so you know that's really quite important I think you see the point is we don't want to be too 21st century rationalistic saying none of this could possibly be happening we need to rationalize it away well take a look at screw tape uh, C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters letter seven I think it is um, 
one of the tactics deny the ex existence of the spiritual world that's a good way to get them overall my advice would be let mark be mark let him be the you know kind of 60 a 60 ce writer he is the first century writer he is and then yes by all means let's apply mark to himself but not let's not make mark a 21st century author and um, let's let him be himself take on board that what that is and then okay we can apply that to our own circumstances let's have a look at secrecy because it keeps coming up and there's different again i'm not expecting you to read these particular questions but they are different ways of saying oh secrecy what, what's going on there and why does he do different things at different times and ask different people different things says this one to be silent this one to go out and preach what's going on here so let's have a go let me give you a review to give you some perspective first jesus does request silence on nine occasions i've counted these by the way there are four healings the transfiguration which we haven't yet come to but is it'll be next week in chapter nine when he's identified as christ in chapter eight and three times for the demons who identify him they're the nine times that jesus says be quiet about it and he does also withdraw from the crowd to heal somebody on three occasions the three overlap with the nine there so it's only nine in all it's just there's an extra element to it in three of them nine remember that number there are 27 miracles in Mark. So secrecy is demanded in only a third of them. It's just interesting perspective. We, we just want to get secrecy into perspective. That's the point. It's not always the norm. On the other hand, it is sometimes. There are also occasions where no secrecy is requested or given. And actually, Jesus often not only permits people to speak, but actually encourages them to do so. And I'm not going to go through all these in detail. You'll have it in the in the material when I send it. Have a look at these and remind yourself of each of these, including the Jairus daughter one, which had a secret element to it. But it was also witnessed as well, wasn't it? And Jesus, remember, speaks quite openly, Paresia, about the suffering of the Son of Man. And on other occasions, whatever Jesus said, realistically, he must have expected people to notice. The people of Nazareth, how did they miss Oh, and he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them, but nothing important, you know. And if you are healing in Capernaum or Bethsaida or Jericho, these are not good places to conceal a miracle with several thousand people in them. So um, I think Jesus's very locations of healing sometimes meant that he wasn't necessarily, um, you know, it was, well, absolute secrecy wasn't really what he was after. But there were reasons to keep a low profile. He had good reasons, as we've already discussed in previous weeks, to avoid misunderstandings so that he att didn't attract the wrong attention. So, for example, as a miracle worker or as a political figure, which he wasn't, he was Messiah, but not the sort that Peter and others expected. He didn't want to attract the attention of the Roman authorities, or at least not now. And he's already in trouble with the religious elites. And again, it's a probably more a question of timing. He absolutely did not want fame, no more than he already had because it actually placed restrictions, didn't it, on his ability to operate. Again, have a look at these references for yourself. I, I don't have time, sadly, to go through all this in detail, but I'm hoping that this presentation material will be stuff that you can go and refer to and, and take a look at for yourself in your own time. The women who heard about Jesus, the two women, Syrophoenician woman and the women with bleeding, they both, they both heard about Jesus's reputation. So fame was kind of a bit two-sided, if you like. There were also, and I just want to pass this by quite quickly, actions that are not really secret. So he does do private instructions. That's not an issue of secrecy. That's an issue of making sure that the people who needed to convey the message fully understood it, even if they didn't always. And he does keep away from the crowd, but that's really more an issue of pragmatics, of rest, of physical safety, or in chapter nine, as we'll see, of focusing his teaching on the disciples. So there are reasons where he kind of goes away, but they're not really about secrecy as such. You see, the real word that I want to recall for you, which I think I talked about in, in, in chapter four, in session five, is the mysterion. Mysterion, which is the word that's used for the secret. That's the one in the, in the parables, when he's talking about the parables. It's a more common word in Paul. And if you look, for example, at the first chapter of the letter to the Colossians, which is an absolutely superb introduction to the wonderful plan of God that reached its climax in Christ. So if you don't know the letter to the Colossians, have a look at chapter one. It's well worth you having a read. 
So musterion there is a kind of shorthand for God's plan as it's revealed in Christ. Um, but in Mark, it's more about the musterion of the kingdom of God that's actually apparent to some extent now and is in breaking in those miracles, but is still to an extent hidden. Remember, the seed is the metaphor, the parable that is used for that secret, but it won't be hidden forever because the parable of the lamp, which follows on immediately from it, makes clear that actually nothing will can be kept secret forever. And there's that repeated phrase about hearing, making sure that we understand that those two things are related to each other. So the mysterion of the kingdom of God is really what Jesus is about and it's going to be revealed. That's what the that's what it was, is the promise. Little hint of it in the transfiguration next week. Don't speak about this until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Don't not speak about it forever. There's a right time for the mysterion to be revealed. And of course, we'll see even later that the centurion's witness of Jesus as the Son of God is not silenced. It's heard loud and clear. And the empty tomb in chapter 16 must remain must be no secret it must be revealed to the disciples and eventually to the whole world the real issue as i think i've said before is that no one really can understand the mysterion of the kingdom of god until the cross and the resurrection have happened and that's why the disciples find it hard going so here's the disciples I've, what i've done here by the way is split up half of a duccio painting um uh, you know so the, uh, so uh, this is the duccio maestà um, which is a very very famous uh, altarpiece so here's the here's the disciples kind of trying to work out what jesus is talking about and here's jesus over here oh and he's a long way away i've kind of deliberately split the picture up they're obviously no, normally next to each other but you know how do i get a hang of what jesus is saying well the deeds of power can i understand that well no it just doesn't kind of seem to happen for them does it they don't really get what's going on there well maybe the teachings Oh, no, we kind of don't get that either, really. And the parables, well, they're even worse. They're kind of a little bit of both, and we really don't get them. The reality is that this is sort of, it's not a wall, but it's a sort of haze through which they can't really fully perceive, a bit like the blind man. They're not understanding, partly because of their hardness of heart. This is not an intellectual problem. It's a moral problem. It's a problem of faith. The real issue is that you only really understand who Jesus is through the cross. And through the cross, you eventually, that becomes the lens, the right way of seeing who Jesus is and what his mission is. So I hope that's a little bit of a summary of the way that it works. So that's that, that's that's hopefully given you a bit of a context on secrecy. I think it's a it's a multifaceted issue, but it's really on something that eventually will become clear. Um, this is a lovely question. Um, is it harder for the righteous people to follow Jesus? Because in Mark chapter two, it said, I've not come to call in the, the question as a translation said, respectable people, but outcasts. So is it easier for people who are not respectable because they haven't got anything to give up? That's not really fair, is it? Well, let's have a look. Um, here, first of all, and by the way, for the questioner, this is no criticism of you at all. In fact, it's, it's a very interesting um, uh, observation you've made here, because the key here is what's the Greek underneath. The Greek word for the righteous or the respectable is dikaios, which is what Joseph is, by the way. Joseph is a dikaios man in the Gospel of Luke. In the Good News translation, which I assume the questioner must have been using, it uses the word respectable. Well, that's not terribly accurate. It's it's kind of refreshingly. Um, it, it does give a perspective on it, um, but perhaps it kind of takes us in a little bit of a different direction. Righteous is what most English translation use. Father Nick King uses just, which is pretty much synonymous, isn't it? And the New Jerusalem Bible uses upright. So most translations, you know, on that left hand end of the sphere um, and in the middle of that sphere um, tend to use that. This is where the good news probably is a little bit kind of um, it's doing its own interpretation as translation. And, and that's where translation and exegesis ideally should be split rather than they're combined it's not a big problem but you can see how it can take you off in a slightly different direction because jesus's focus on the sinner well for a start it doesn't mean he's not interested in the righteous because that's a particular semitic way of saying i'm not doing this but i'm doing this but that doesn't mean i'm not doing this at all it just means i've got a greater focus on the other because for the avoidance of doubt 
all the righteous, they're sinners too. They just perhaps don't know it as well as the, as the sinners do. Um, respectable people, you see, with, with worldly possessions, well, what are they to do? And the answer is, well, we're going to find out in two weeks' time when we come to Mark chapter 10 with, with one of the harder stories in the entire gospel with the story of the rich young man. The reality is that we are called, or many of us are called, to radical discipleship. And we are called to different things. And you think, well, that's not fair. Well, maybe not, but um, it certainly seems to be the principle that Jesus, in both in terms of what he demands and what he gives, it's not exactly equitable in human terms look at the parable of the laborers which is in matthew only but it's that wonderful story about the people who came at the end the johnny come lately's got paid the same as the ones who've been working all day well yeah, that's the kingdom of god says jesus so each of us is called in our own way and i was answering mike a couple of weeks ago saying we're not all called to do the same thing our task is to determine our call the call that is unique to me, which St. John Henry Newman will tell you is something that's really important. God has a unique service for each of us. Let's have another question then. So does Mark know about Jesus's thoughts and emotions? This certainly subject that came up in our group is, you know, how did he really know what was going on? I think there might even be a question on similar lines in the chat, actually. So, um, you know, what's going on here when Mark says, you know, the power went out of him or Jesus felt like this or whatever? Did he really know? Well, Remember, first of all, Mark is a divine work in the sense that it is Holy Scripture, but it's also a human work. It must be both. And in its human aspect, as I think we've discussed before, it uses literary conventions. And one of those is the knowledgeable narrator. I haven't used omniscient here because I want to avoid any confusion with the nature of God. Um, but it's certainly Mark is a knowledgeable narrator. He does have access to Jesus's thoughts and emotions. How has he done that? Has he made it up? Well, it's not impossible that the information could have come from Jesus himself. Jesus could have told Peter, who could have told Mark. That's not impossible. And so it could have landed in the tradition in, in a variety of different ways. I don't think it really matters, you know, um, because the focus for us is on the text. That's what we've been given by the Holy Spirit. We've been given a text. We've not been given a mirror through to the historical Jesus. We can't know what that is. What the Holy Spirit has given us is this scripture, this gospel, and it says Jesus felt that way. That's what you go with, I think, would be my. So that's the only intention that we can assess. And it's no less authoritative, whether it came from Mark, whether it came from Jesus, whether it came from Peter, whether it came from oral tradition. It doesn't matter. The final text is what is um, is is what is blessed by God and is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So we can trust the text of Mark. It's not only the right thing logically to do in human terms, but it is the right thing in terms of a faith-based approach. Here's a lovely question. I really like this one. Mark and the Nativity Stories, really nice, lovely short question as well. Why do Mark and John ignore the Nativity Story? Now, the reason I love your questions is that there's often an assumption buried in them. Um, and so I, I might be wrong here, but I'm going to choose to take it on in this way. Here's uh, Giotto's wonderful painting, by the way, of the Nativity. Um, well, first of all, if we do accept the hypothesis that Mark was first, then strictly speaking, Matthew and Luke added things to Mark. So that's just, I'm not just being kind of clever on that. I'm just saying that's a, it's a perspective issue again. Um, if we do accept Mark and priority, then what we're not looking at is somebody abandoning something. We're talking about somebody else adding something that they felt they wanted to include. And by the way, we must also talk of nativity stories in the plural, not a single story. And that's because we're all guilty of harmonizing the Matthean and Lucan accounts, particularly at Christmas, where we've got a lovely combination of the two things that are actually supposed to be separate. So have a look at your accounts at Christmas and see if you can tell the difference between the two. So Matthew and Luke don't contain the same details. So we have to talk of stories in the plural. And their purpose in including the stories, by the way, appears to be different. But we're not talking about Matthew and Luke right now. So that, I will just say that much. Look, we don't know whether Mark even had access to these traditions. So we don't even know whether it was a possibility. Whether he did or not, again, we have to go with the text as it is and judge it on its own basis. Mark's focus is on Jesus, who Jesus is, and the implications of following him. He didn't need a nativity narrative. 
that's really it's as simple as that it doesn't look like it would have added much in fact given the virtues of mark in terms of the strong sense of direction uh, of kind of direction and kind of forward momentum and the kind of fast pace maybe an additivity story wouldn't have kind of fitted very well with that so that that would be probably the, the broad answer i would give to that question let's go back to this issue of literalness though um how literal we take the stories um, and this really just relates to the fact of, oh, well, we've got 5,000 people being fed and 4,000 people, at these number of baskets, etc. Is this all, can we, you know, do we, can we believe any of this stuff? Um, and isn't this just a kind of complete own goal when we're, when we're talking to people who are sceptical because they just say, oh, well, that's just a load of rubbish, isn't it? Well, first of all, are the numbers exaggerated? Well, I mean, 5,000 is... OK, on one side, it's twice the population of Capernaum or Bethsaida. On the other hand, it only needs a Capernaum or Bethsaida to combine. And if most of the population have gone out, you've got it. And there are several settlements of that size along the northern and northwestern and northeastern shores of the Sea of Galilee. And the Markan text also alludes to people traveling large distances and from a whole load of various places. So 5,000 doesn't necessarily seem to be an, a, you know, a huge number in that context. And of course, John the Baptist did the same as well. He drew huge crowds to the Jordan. Now, the numbers may have symbolic meaning, but that doesn't discount the fact that they are large crowds. However you read this, Mark is being very clear, these are large crowds. Now, it's not about history, remember. It's not about 5,000 or 4,999 or whatever. You know, we are not in reportage here. This is gospel. Mark has got a message in each of these stories. And by the way, despite the fact that they're not being history, um, the gospels, in this particular case, four gospels, four independent witnesses for a single episode. I doubt if you can find a single Greco-Roman or um, historian for whom you can find that many independent witnesses. So if we don't like the gospels, we don't like Tacitus, we don't like Herodotus. In fact, we might as well just disbelieve pretty much everything that was written. And by the way, if we want to think about that being just a matter for the ancient world, arguments about numbers happen today, don't they? If you're Donald Trump, you think you had millions of people at your inauguration. And if you're CNN, you thought differently. Um, and I'm not even getting into the debate. I'm just saying, if we can't work it out in the 21st century, what right have we got to challenge the Gospels? Anyway, taking it on. Taking up your cross. Um, again, I'm not going to have time to read the question, but the issue is really taking up your cross. Did Jesus really mean that in a physical, specific way about crosses? You know, maybe a bit later and around Mark's time, but in Jesus's time as well? Well, yes. Crucifixion was used not just for crimes, but for um, as a penalty for political resistance. And here's three circumstances um, where there are actual events that are uh, described in the historians of the time. Um, slave revolt, you remember Spartacus, if you, you remember the good old Kirk Douglas film. Um, that was a classic example of uh, kind of about 70 years before Christ. Um, so by no means an anachronism, well established for several centuries, even in Judea, by the way, because it had been started by um, the Persians, the Greeks carried it on, and even the Jews had a go before Roman occupation. So it's not quite true that the Jews couldn't uh, crucify people. They just couldn't crucify people under the Romans because the Romans regarded it as their, um, uh, you know, th their privilege to do so. Um, so taking up a cross, by the way, this picture over here, you might know is one of the earliest pieces of anti-Christian graffiti. I don't have time to describe it in detail, but you can clearly see it's a cross scene. Um, it's therefore entirely plausible that the historical Jesus could have regarded crucifixion as not only possible, but potentially imminent, not just for himself, but also for his followers. It obviously did happen to him in the end, and the pretext was political, like a lot of these, remember the inscription said, King of the Jews. So preaching the gospel didn't need to be the offence, you see. It was enough to be simply associated with Jesus. And that's the resonance that happens when Peter is addressed by a mere slave girl or servant girl when he's at the door. You were with Jesus, weren't you? Don't tell anybody that. That's why he feels he has to deny it. Not because he's frightened of the servant girl, but he's frightened that at any moment somebody will slap their hand on his shoulder and say, you're nicked, mate. So that's a real, real fear. And the resonance in chapter eight of being ashamed of Jesus is all about the fear of the, the, literally the physical consequences of going to the cross. So I think it is a very real threat um, that is a real contemporary threat. Um, again, whether it's a threat that Mark an audience or it's the actual words of Jesus, doesn't really matter because the text of Mark is the thing that's inspired. 
did the Gentiles matter? It's another topic. Um, you know, okay, Jesus mostly was of Jews. He seemed to kind of touch on kind of doing things with Gentiles. Was he really, though, more interested in the Jews? Yep, he was focused on the Jews, all right. But clearly his ministry spilled over into Gentiles as much by Gentiles coming to him as him actually going to them. Was the, Would they have got it was the essence of my questioner's question. Why, you know, Jews would have understood about Messiah. What was the appeal to Gentiles? Well, many Gentiles had already embraced some aspects of Judaism. There was a um, people who were referred to as God-fearers, who'd kind of, adapt, you know, were into the scriptures, were into various things, not necessarily the food laws and definitely not circumcision, but they were, they were part of the way and even went to synagogues. These people would definitely have been familiar with the scriptures. And as we see in Acts of the Apostles, they become a prime target audience for the initial mission to the Gentiles. They are the low hanging fruit, if you like. People like Cornelius, who we just heard about a few weeks ago, didn't we, uh, in the readings at Mass. And, you know, there's lots of references to that in various parts of Acts that I've left you as an exercise to go and look up for yourself. The gospel, therefore, has its roots in Hebrew scripture, but its overall message is universal. It's got to be preached to the whole world, and that's the command of Jesus himself. And Paul's preaching in Acts and his letters show us how the pitch varied between the Jews and the Gentiles and how the pitch evolved, if you like, to appeal to the Gentiles. But this really ultimately is a story not about the just Jesus Christ, Messiah, but the Son of God, which is the really important thing for Gentiles as well as Jews. Demons and pigs, this came up at the time and it's kind of uh, won't go away. Um, the, the, the question was basically, why, why did he let the demons enter the pigs? Was, you know, that wasn't really very fair, was it? Well, let's acknowledge a few things. Again, Mark is Mark. We must let Mark be a first century text. It has its own world and we must respect that and go with it. We can't impose 21st century presuppositions or values on it. That is pure anachronism and we mustn't do it. That's foreign to the world of the text. So we can't say, well, this is not much of an animal rights thing. You might be right in its application now. And if we were trying to use this, for example, as an excuse for mistreating animals, I think that would be a very poor reading of the text. But on the other hand, we can't really also say Jesus wasn't very good because he didn't believe in animal rights. And um, that is kind of foreign to the, to the world of the gospel. Uh, it looks like the demons had to go somewhere. I didn't have a chance to put in the quotation, but there was a reference. Um, I think it's in chapter 11 of Luke talking about a demon wandering around looking for places to go, as, um, which is a very peculiar image. But there you go. That's, and so there was clearly a risk of demons being out there in the open, on the loose. Um, not just that they could possess others, but clearly if they were legion um, and lots of them, they could uh, affect a large number of other people. And in any case, uh, you know, and again, you might not like this, but in, a, in, 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 in that area and to a Jewish mentality, particularly pigs were of relatively limited value. And nevertheless, despite that, Mark acknowledges that there is an economic and a security impact on the local community. And that's why they tell Jesus to clear off, don't they? They don't like um, their pigs being destroyed. Now. Let's get away from that, though, and look at the real bigger picture, because that's often the issue in this story. We mustn't allow our own local 21st century concerns to lose sight of what is the story telling us. Jesus is the one who has power over the evil forces. He is the stronger one, and he's burgling Satan's property here. A man was saved from evil. That's the big picture here. Somebody was saved and healed and then went on to proclaim about Jesus as a result. So should the locals have been completely uninterested in what happened to the man and only worried about the loss of their head and this worrying man who was doing strange things? In sending Jesus away, did they actually pass up the opportunity of a lifetime? And is that a lesson for us in our economic and other values? Do we do that? To what extent are they getting in the way of our taking on board the true message of the gospel? And finally, I think this is the final question. Where did all the baskets come from? <laughs> it's a lovely question. Well, um, there, remember, there are two types of baskets. So in the feeding of the 5,000, they're called kofinos. They look roughly like this, we think. Um, they're definitely of a size and material where they could be easily carried. Um, 
And we, we know this because the juvenile, the, the, the Latin poet Juvenal in his satires talks um, in, in a couple of satires, he talks about the Jews carrying these provision baskets with them on their journeys regularly, even in an even in an urban place like Rome. The spuris of the feeding of the 4000 in chapter eight. Um, well, we don't exactly know what it is, but a spuris was used. Here's poor old Paul getting let down the walls of Damascus to escape. He's not looking very happy about it. He's looking a bit uncertain. But it's a kind of wicker basket it's got there. I mean, who knows? This is obviously a medieval illustration, but it was clearly big enough. Some people think it was a kind of rope type thing, you know, so, you know, that, that, um, but anyway, whatever the thing, it was light enough to be carried probably, but strong enough and big enough to hold, um, you know, a, a large burden. The key thing is in both cases, anybody who is any distance from their home, which in both the 5,000 and the 4,000 they were, would surely have had to carry something about around them. Even if they were hungry by the end, they started off with something, one assumes, because that would be nuts, wouldn't it, to, to go out without, with, with nothing, really. Um, and there were no, you couldn't just pop into your Tesco Metro or your Sainsbury's local um, because there wasn't one. So some provisions, and that's probably where the baskets came from. If Even if the people didn't do it, the disciples may have done it themselves. The point is that they, these weren't unusual things to be around. You didn't have to go to your local Tesco store to get one. And I think that's it, which I've done just before 9.30. So I'll stop sharing and return. So again, with apologies for the lightning pace of that. Um, but again, I am going to send that document out so that you can have a look at it um, and, and kind of uh, hopefully take in some of the detail much more easily than we've been able to do in this session. But I think what we're going to do now in the remaining seconds is we'll say a final prayer. I'll give you a blessing and then we'll carry on with the remaining questions that we've got here, which I think I'm pretty confident if that's all we've got on the chat um, that I can do in the next 10 minutes. If you if those of you who asked want to hang on. So let us pray. Lord God, our father, thank you for bringing us together and thank you that you are continuing to be with us in your word through your Holy Spirit, continue to give us fresh insights into what you want us to know about your love for us and your plan for us. And knowing that plan, give us courage to play our part in supporting your plan. So that in everything we may give you the glory, you who are Lord forever and ever. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, or please do, if you can, stay for 10 minutes and we'll get these last few chat questions done. Jared. Oh, Marina's got one and she can, Marina got her hand up, so I'm just going to let her say so. Oh, oh no, she didn't. Oh, no. <laughs> that was me clapping and saying thank you, Mark. Oh, bless you. You're very kind. <laughs> Jared, then, the floor is yours. So this came from Audrey, um, which was, is there something that's still bothering you? And the question it was, was the accuracy of the dialogue when the, oh, stories, yeah, yeah. when the stories have been passed down orally. So how so, can we, how can we, what assumptions can we make as the accuracy of the dialogues? Right. So first question, first, first point to answer that question. It's a great question, by the way. Um, so first point is Mark is not a 21st century biography. It is not a 21st century um, historical work. So, um, I think expecting full accuracy of quotations is is not reasonable because it's not consistent with its genre, I think. So that would be the first thing. That having been said, there is a remarkable consistency in Gospels that otherwise you would think have very different tradition sources. In other words, we've got the same words being recorded alongside different oral paths and coming together in the same way, which gives us the feel that some of these things definitely were the very words of Jesus. There is a fancy Latin term called ipsissima verba, 
um, which the scholars kind of use sometimes to say the very words of Jesus. Um, and the other reason we think that is some of the things that Jesus says are so controversial, so difficult, so embarrassing, so um, counterintuitive that nobody could have made them up. And I think there is a, that, that is an interesting argument on one side. So I think, you know, the, I think some of the, these things reflect the words of Jesus. But the reality is, even where they don't, and for example, where Gospels reflect the words differently, that should not disturb us. The inspiration is in the text of the Gospels we've been given, not in some historical context that we cannot see through to. So trust the Gospels, trust the individual Gospels, trust the variations in the Gospels and rejoice in those variations because they are showing us different aspects of a God that we can never summarize. So I hope that I hope that answers the uh, answers the question. Um, and if not, you can come back to me another week as well, Audrey. OK, Jared, your next one. So we're so used to the idea of Jesus teaching in the synagogue. But how common would it be for a layman to be teaching? Um, well, we don't really have a concept. Uh, you see, lay. Lay is a kind of anachron, it's a bit of an anachronism really when applied there. There were rabbis, but there, there wasn't the same degree of ordination that we have, for example, regarding our, our own Catholic clergy. Um, the reality is that somebody who was invited to speak could speak. Um, and presumably that was on the basis that the person who invited them thought they had something interesting to say. So um, Paul was invited. Um, he had no you know, rabbinical qualifications as such. He had sat at the feet of Gamaliel, but, um, and they might or might not have known that, but the point is um, they asked him to speak. I think the impression that we have is that um, they were relatively, you know, there was, a, there was a degree of openness, perhaps more than, for example, the Catholic Church allows uh, where only the ordained may uh, preach in the pulpit in the Ambo, for example. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a slightly different environment. Um, it, it wasn't uncommon. Um, as I say, there was less of an issue of um, formally ordained people as well. So that was less of a barrier from that perspective. OK. Right. So. When did Mark become part of the canon of scripture? Uh, I didn't have time to research this. I'm not an expert in canonicity. Um, the, the canon, okay, the canon, broadly speaking, evolved from, well, again, the problem is that there wasn't, there wasn't a council of X where they said, let's have a canon. Uh, the, the, some of them were, let's, let's, let's settle on one. But the idea that we, let's, let's try to build one, there was never a first one of the, those processes. So what we can say is that over the last decades of the first century, many communities began to regard certain works as highly trustworthy and authoritative. Paul's letters come into that category. Mark's gospel clearly comes into that category because it was then used by Matthew and Luke, at the very least, we believe. Um, so, so that idea of them becoming authoritative, which is slightly different from canonical, I think is a late first century concept. And then we see these things being quoted in the apostolic letters of the early second century. So the people like people, you know, the likes of Clement of Rome and um, the Didache, etc. We've got quotations um, from the gospels and from Paul in those. So we can see a practical, um, um, you know, trustworthiness and authority coming through there. Actual canons are not developed really until um, the third century when we have the threat of heresy, particularly under Marcion, which is one of the big pressures. Most of the big theological developments, by the way, come as a result of a reaction to heresy, um, so, um, which is good because you've got to get your act together. If somebody's saying it's like this and you say it isn't, you've got to get some sort of sen sensible arguments as to why it isn't. So if Marcion said this is not scripture, they had to decide what was scripture and what wasn't and have some criteria to do that. That's a, a mid third century development and uh, becomes formalized in the third and fourth centuries. And, uh, you know, the canon is broadly fixed sometime in the um, 
six, seven hundreds. I, I can't remember exactly when is the honest answer. Hope that's good enough. <clears throat> Gradual process is one of the key things here. That's a really important theme on all of this. Okay. So why, so why did Jesus want to walk by when the wind was tossing them about in the boats? Well, again, uh, yeah, I think we have to recognise that this story, um, while it may have, may well have um, a historical reality associated with it, is important in Mark as much for its symbolic um, value as for its historical value. Um, so the walk by I alluded to um, a week or so ago when we were talking about this story, that's an incredibly important verb in the Hebrew, in the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. We are having a hint there that this is God we're talking about, just like the it is I, um, which came up in the question that we were talking about. So those two things together, I think the significance is more in the resonance of the verb than it is in the actual um, drama or, or specifics of the situation. Um, he wasn't being unkind. The boat wasn't sinking. It wasn't like uh, the thing in chapter four. So just again, we've got to watch that we don't harmonize the accounts here in our in our mind, um, uh, uh, you know, un unwittingly harmonize them. The, the disciples were in no danger. Um, so, you know, there was a bit of a wind, but they weren't uh, they weren't in danger of drowning, or at least Mark doesn't tell us so. Hope that helps. We've got one at the top, Jared. I don't know whether you've missed it, but um, I'm happy to take it on. So. so I'll take this on while you're finding another one. So it's, the question was from Sheena and it said, Jesus sometimes comes across as angry or impatient. How does this tie in with the fruits of the spirit? I think that's a rather lovely question, actually. Um, very insightful. Uh, OK, I think we need to distinguish between anger and anger. Um, there is an anger that is just and um, appropriate when we see injustice wrong and evil we must not tolerate a toleration is a again a virtue a 20th century virtue that uh, um, mark particularly would have had relatively little understanding of um we should not tolerate injustice violence evil or all those bad things we should fight them um and 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 part of that is is having a feeling of indignation against them um so Jesus is not getting angry in terms of losing his temper or being cross or grumpy. Well, I know it's a tendency to use that word, but these are all morally loaded words, which I don't think apply to Jesus, who, um, to remind you in the words of the letter to the Hebrews, was without sin. <laughs> and for the avoidance of all doubt. Um, so um, he was tempted in every way that we are, but he is without sin. So the anger... Um, and the impatience here are a desire to see right rather than an expression of lack of emotional control. That's the way I'd probably answer the question. And therefore, we are to imitate Jesus in the same way. Um, when we are losing control, we are directly against the spirit, as the apostle explicitly tells us. Lack of self-control is one of the problems, um, but the fruits of the spirit include um, a degree of self-control. So um, that, that, I think that's the distinction between the two. Emotion, yes. Lack of control, no. Jared, I don't think we've got any more questions. There's one right at the bottom, but it's more. I think it's a comment more than a question. <clears throat> yeah, from, I think so. Um, yeah, from I've got, and what Naomi and Alexi talked about, we've we've covered. So I and uh, Jeff's comment, uh, Jeff's observation, we've also got. So I think we're there. Um, absolutely wonderful. And I've just managed to get you just only two minutes after um, 940, which is good. Um, I'm sorry that this was so fast paced. Um, your questions were more demanding than I expected, but they were wonderful. Um, so thank you to those who did post their questions. Um, I'm sorry if you had a question and we haven't quite got round to it. There'll still be the chance in future weeks. Um, but thank you for those who did post questions. Thank you for so kindly staying with me to hear the answers. Um, I hope for those who had their questions answered, I correctly interpreted them. If I didn't, may I maxima culpa? Uh, and you are free to email me to tell me how wrong I am. And I will try and recover myself um, in doing that. So, um, but for now, um, thank you so much. Um, I hope you have a really good weekend. Um, 
I hope you're lucky enough to go to a mass where Deacon Jared is preaching rather than me. Um, so no, I, I would say no. <laughs> So, um, Definitely not. Because if you're because if you're in St. Peter's, you you're stuck with one or other of us. Um, so, uh, but anyway, I hope you enjoy the weekend. That side part, and um, I look forward, God willing, to seeing you next week. In the meantime, have a good time. Bless you all. Thank you. God bless. Thank you.